It seems to me singularly appropriate to have Louis Lapham deliver the keynote speech at a uh, conference on truth-telling because Louis has never been afraid to tell the truth, even or especially at the uh, darkest moments of our recent history when so many writers, thinkers, politicians, and so-called public uh, intellectuals chose instead to keep their eyes shut and their mouths closed. Uh, Lewis is currently the editor of the um, informative and physically beautiful magazine, Laugham's Quarterly. He was for many years the editor of Harper's Magazine. He's written essays for probably any publication and journal you might ever want to read. His own books include Gag Rule, Waiting for the Barbarians, and Pretensions to Empire. He uh, was inducted in 2007 into the American, so the, uh, American Society Hall of Fame of Magazine Editors. And um, it's been my own great fortune to, um, to work with him. He edited several pieces I wrote for Harper's and more recently for Laugham's Quarterly. Not only is he a brilliant writer whose books include Gag Rule, Pretensions to Empire, and Waiting for the Barbarians, but he's a dream editor. Uh, he pushes, he his partly because of his meticulous attention to language, but also because he urges and pushes writers to think more deeply and clearly and to go further than we thought we could and, and in some cases than we even wanted to. My own most memorable experience working with Lewis, I was writing a piece for Harper's about the way in which literature is taught uh, in high schools, a piece called, that was eventually called, I Know Why the Cage Bird Can't Read, um, which as you can tell, got us all into a lot of trouble. And uh, at some point when I was writing the piece, it became clear to me that, uh, that the dismantling of the public education system in this country was not a matter of accident and not a matter of, of negligence, but really a matter of design that the creation of an underclass who would provide uh, cheap labor was very much in the interest of corporate America. Of course, this was still when uh, there were jobs for cheap labor. And, um, and I said to Lewis, this idea of the purposeful uh, uh, destruction of the educational system, doesn't that sound a little paranoid to you? And Lewis said, that's not paranoia, it's reality. I can't think of anyone who's better qualified to help us all distinguish between paranoia and reality than Lewis Laffer. Thank you, Francine, for that gracious introduction. And the, um, I, I have to tell you that speaking before an audience at Bard College in the presence of some of the people that I know are in the audience, as well as Francine and Leon Botstein and the, and, uh, the writing of Hannah Arendt, I'm reminded of my first tutorial at Cambridge University in the autumn of 1956. I don't now remember the name of the don assigned by Magdalen College to set my new world feet on the path of the old world wisdom. But I remember the setting, late afternoon fog, coals burning in an ancient grate, the don in academic gown seated behind a silver tea service, preliminary remarks in favor of Samuel Pepys and Admiral Lord Nelson. <laughs> Five months earlier, I had been graduated from Yale University with honors on my final examinations and the intention of becoming an historian. My professors in New Haven had welcomed the prospect, leading me to believe that I had a firm grasp of what was then a trend-setting course of study admitted to the curriculum under the rubric of intellectual history. Mention the name of a sublime poet or an unhorsed king, and I was the fellow to attach the wiring to the appropriate zeitgeist, produce concepts not unlike the ones that prompted the 16th century Cambridge wits, among them Christopher Marlowe, to think that Lord Strange, they could teach them the trick of changing lead into gold. 
My tutor was delighted to learn that wonders never ceased. Yes, well, he said, I see great, great news. But perhaps you could spare a few moments for the 12th century. <laughs> I managed to sustain the illusion of scholarship for about the length of time it takes to deal or see five deals of blackjack, drawing parallels between the Ptolemaic universe and the semicircular arrangement of Amsterdam's canals, sending Eleanor of Aquitaine on the Second Crusade in company with a Red Cross Knight and a manual of courtly love. Those kind of remarks. <laughs> <laughs> and when I run through my brief repertoire, the tutor poured us both a second cup of tea and for the next quarter of an hour, with an air of utmost courtesy, offering plum cake or perhaps a glass of sherry, he asked questions about aspects of the 20, 12th century that possibly I had overlooked. <laughs> the coins in circulation on the upper and lower Rhine, times of travel by land from Rouen to Bordeaux, by sea from Marseille to Dover, what was afoot with the heavenly host in Rome, as between the two cities of Cairo and Baghdad, which boasted the larger concentrations of wealth and religious superstition. In Byzantium, the prices bid and asked for Russian fur and Christian slaves. My failure to even hazard a plausible guess moved the Don to a gentle murmur of mild regret. Yes, well, he said, you, you Americans have this wonderful talent for broad statement and grand abstraction that hasn't been granted to their less fortunate relatives here in England. Before reaching the general theory, you see, we like to have in mind at least a passing acquaintance with some of the facts. <laughs> I then, um, I'm used to living in a world without facts. <laughs> I left uh, I gave up the idea of trying to become an historian, and I went to, uh, into the world of journalism. And I've been, I've been in journalism for 50-odd years, and so when it comes to talking about truth and facts, I, I, I tend to um, frame it in, in the context of journalism. And I, I've, uh, yeah, I'm old enough to have been through a long series of changes. I'm old enough to remember the copy pencil, the linotype machine, and the typewriter. And it's, it's never uh, been easy uh, to, tell, to tell the truth. And the, um, it's, it's, uh, the truth doesn't have a very big fan base. <laughs> it's, it's not a popular consumer product. And the People, uh, and you, you can just read through the history of, you could say that Christ was telling the truth and in a, I believe, a revolutionary way, challenging the status quo and was crucified. Giordano Bruno was burned at the stake and so forth. You can read through the whole record of, of history and find any number of people telling the truth and uh, are outcast or they lose their careers. Charlie Chaplin was the uh, probably the richest movie star in America in the 1920s and 1930s, a man of great uh, fame. Movies were very popular. The character of the, played the character of the tramp. His, he did not have a programmatic Marxist or socialist uh, political um, program, but he had an instinctive anti-authoritarian impulse and sought to express it with his sympathy for the poor, his um, distrust, uh, 
disgust with the, the arrogance of the oligarchies in power in whatever form they took, and for the oppression of the freedoms of mind. And when he, he made many uh, silent films to this effect, carrying this kind of uh, message, which was popular, well received. I mean, you, but when he began to speak uh, after, toward the end of the 30s, he began to, people then be, uh, began to take less seriously his, his politics because they suddenly didn't want to hear that from a movie star, nor did they want to hear what he was saying about uh, Nazi Germany. He was one of very few um, movie stars in Hollywood in the 30s that actively attacked and called attention to the horrors of the, of the Nazi regime. And his, <coughs> that they were prevented from making movies to that effect. The, the movie industry shut down those movies because they were afraid of uh, building up war fever in the United States and they didn't want to uh, interrupt, interfere with our American government's uh, relations with Nazi Germany. And Chaplin's career uh, went into decline. And because he had gotten too far out onto a limb of uh, a, a politics or, or a, of a truth-telling that, that wasn't welcome. That happened, as you all know, to a, a number of other people during the McCarthy hearings in, in the 1950s. And what I learned, of course, from in the newspaper business was that the uh, News is not what happened yesterday. It's a story about what happened yesterday. And the, um, it was one often that the uh, papers, editors thought that its readers wanted to hear. <laughs> I, I can remember the, uh, an incident when I was working for the Herald Tribune in the early 60s. I was on the rewrite desk and a story, a short three paragraph story, came in from our uh, correspondent in Moscow. And it was three paragraphs about the Academy of, so of the Soviet Academy of Sciences had had a meeting to discuss something that was unclear in the three paragraphs. It couldn't have been a more innocuous news item. And I was putting it into the typewriter, and the editor of the magazine was John Denson, looked over my shoulder and said, that means World War III. <laughs> and I said, I'm sure it does, uh, Your Honor, but I don't see it in, in, in those three paragraphs. And he said, well, here's a name that you will call. He's a young man at, at Columbia, and he will tell you why those three paragraphs mean World War III. And he gave me the phone number, and it was uh, Big New Brzezinski. <laughs> and I called Brzezinski, introduced myself, and when Brzezinski understood what it was Denson wanted to hear, he, he eloquent. I mean, suddenly I had a, a um, um, 12 paragraph lead story that they could put a headline on with the dateline Moscow, but had actually been uh, produced at Morningside Heights. And, <clears throat> and with the name of the, um, the, our foreign correspondent in Moscow as, as the byline. So this came out in the first edition, and there, I need hardly say, there was no such story in the New York Times, but there was the next morning. 
By the time we got around to the final edition, somebody at the Times in New York had called the Times guy in Moscow and wanted to know how he'd missed the beginning of World War III. <laughs> but in other words, the newspapers are um, um, tricky, and, and they, they always have been in, in, in the United States. You, you go, our press, you, you read the papers in the 1790s during the bitter argument between the Federalists and the, and the Republicans over the elections of John Adams and, and then Jefferson. And the, the papers are extremely um, partisan, more propaganda than not, libel at levels that would not be conceivable uh, today. Tom Paine, who had told the truth in, during the American Revolution, after the war, um, the U.S. Congress didn't particularly want to hear from uh, Paine anymore because they were in the business now of dividing up the, new, the newly inherited or the newly appropriated estate from the Crown of England. And Paine, the notion of the common man and uh, distribution of power was not welcome. And they didn't give him a, uh, any kind of a um, government post. And, and so he left in exile for first London and then France. And when he came in France, he was elected to the committee to write the new French constitution. He was actually elected to the French assembly from the district of Calais. And when it came to a matter of a vote in the assembly as to uh, execute the king and queen, Payne got up and he couldn't he couldn't speak French, but through translation into English, uh, spoke out against um, the execution of the king and the queen. This is not, uh, the, it's the first strong statement anywhere uh, uh, against the death penalty. It is enough to overthrow the monarchy. There is no reason to take upon ourselves the same kind of uh, cruelty, brutality, administered by the monarchy. And for this, he was thrown into prison by Robespierre and marked for execution, which he escaped by the merest chance. That's a long story, but it, it, was, it was just somebody put the wrong chalk mark on the wrong door on the day that he was being transferred to the guillotine. When he came back to the United States, he was uh, reviled. The, um, he was considered to be too much of a, of a revolutionary. Members of the Federalists, because he had written from France attacking Adams and uh, Washington. And the, uh, he was met at the, at the ship in, in Baltimore with people throwing uh, rotten eggs and, and, and tomatoes at him. You read through the history of the, of the 19th century and you see uh, people that try to tell the truth um, often ignored. Twain couldn't publish his more acerbic uh, remarks about the failures of the American democracy and the tendencies into an oligarchy which overwhelmed the country toward the end of the 19th century, Gilded Age. So his most acerbic remarks, the letters to the earth, are not published until after his death. Melville uh, writes a wonderful book, The Confidence Man, 
in the middle of the uh, 19th century, which gets no attention, whatever. And after the publication of Moby Dick in the 18, early 1850s, uh, again, it was, the reviews were hostile and condescending. And Melville spent the last 30, 20 odd years of his life working as a customs clerk in New York City, being paid $3.40 an hour. Yeah, is it there? Yeah. Okay, is that better? All right. The Edith Wharton uh, goes to Europe. Ambrose Bierce goes to Mexico. Ezra Pound goes to Europe. The, um, the problems of telling the truth are. Um, It, it's not easy. Um, it takes a great deal of courage. And I can remember that uh, during the time when I was the editor of, of, of Harper's Magazine, my way of, of trying um, to find the truth was to hear it in, in, in the strength and the voice of the, the writer. If, if I could. I'd begin reading, and, and within three or four pages, if I could hear the voice of, of a writer trying to uh, speak to what he or she had seen, felt, known, believed, come to know, but it, it, it would be reflected in, in, the, uh, in, in the conviction, even though it may have been against the grain of popular opinion. That, to me, was the truth. I, I, could, I could hear it in the voice, and it was different than somebody trying to write an annual report or a political speech or a, um, a document with a political purpose, a seeking of grace and favor or a trying to get the exam question right. I mean, here was somebody uh, following the line of the, the thought or the phrase or the next sentence into who knows where. And, and it was the, the sense of uh, willingness to <coughs> take the chance. Um, maybe be wrong. Uh, Archibald MacLeish once said that the dissenter is every human being who temporarily resigns from the herd and thinks for himself or his help. And that's, that's, uh, that's hard to do. And I always, the telling of a true story is uh, also a matter which uh, Hannah Arendt talks about in her essay, Truth and Politics, when she's referring to it in ancient Greece, it's a, it's, you need somebody else in the conversation. You, the other person in the conversation has to also be trying to tell the truth. And you can't really have a a conversation between somebody who's trying to tell the truth and somebody who is lying or is just a rhetorician. And that's, that's um, I, I want to read you a, a quote to that effect because that, to me, is the, that was the point of the uh, readers of Harper's Magazine. I mean, I, they, they, they'd write letters and there was a correspondence, and they had a faith in language. They would correct mistakes. They would point out that this paragraph made most sense, or this fact was wrong, but they held to the, to the belief in the 
meaning and uses of words. And, and that was their great strength. I'm trying to find this quotation for you from um, James, Fenner, James Fenimore Cooper. As long ago as 1838, he's addressing, he, write, he writes a book, The American Democrat, which is one of the finest books that I've read trying to explain who or what is an American. And he argues that the word American is synonymous with the habit of telling the truth. And then he goes on to say, by candor, we are not to understand a trifling and uncalled for expositions of the truth, but a sentiment that proves a conviction of the necessity of speaking truth when speaking at all, a contempt for all designing evasions of our real opinions. In all the general concerns, the public has a right to be treated with candor without this manly and truly Republican quality the institutions are converted into a stupendous fraud. And he's saying that in 1838. That is, I think, what uh, Arendt is saying. And that is where I locate the uh, hope for the future. The world is always full of, uh, there are always too many facts. There are more facts today than we know what to do with. They come out, they come so quickly, 24-7, that they blow away and shred as if they were in a news, in a news, uh, you know, in a wind tunnel. And we lose track of who we are, where we're from, uh, what, it, what is our story. Um, and I've, this is one of the reasons, probably the major reason, that I've shifted from Harper's Magazine to doing a, a quarterly that deals with the voices in time, that is to say, history. I, have, I, I take a, approach a topic in the news, money, war, nature, education, and then I bring to bear on it uh, the voices of people like Thucydides or Tolstoy or Virginia Woolf or Empedocles you know, across the last 3,000 odd years because what uh, makes uh, truth survive, I think, is in the uh, force of the imagination and the power of expression. And some years ago, I read an editorial in the New York Times saying that great uh, institutions of the media magnify a human voice. And I don't think that that's the right verb. I think they, the media can amplify a voice in the same way that a loudspeaker does in a ballpark or a prison. But what magnifies the voice is its uh, force of imagination and, and power of expression. And, and I find that. So I find in the reading of history and in the coming across um, satirists on, the, say, the level of Twain or of Juvenal, uh, an inexhaustible uh, resource and, and a uh, uh, common store of energy and, and hope. I mean, I, history is the, Goethe once makes the point that he who cannot draw on 3,000 years is living hand to mouth. It's our inheritance. I mean, what we what we're part of the same uh, uh, human expedition that set out low these many years ago from Africa and finds its way into Mesopotamia and then 
into the Mediterranean and so forth. And over the, the journey over the frontiers of the millennia, uh, mankind saves what it finds to be beautiful or useful or true. A lot is lost, but much is saved. And the, um, a sense of history gives you a sense of a broader and wider self, which is the same thing that you get from the community of readers who are trying to tell the truth. In other words, the exchange is the <coughs> labor of the reader uh, put to the wheel of the writer's imagination. And it's, it's the, it's the, what's created by their common effort is uh, a fact. <laughs> and also, if they're both trying to tell the truth as they know it, and are not trying to sell a hamburger or a dress or a politician, which is a different kind of use of the truth, which unfortunately is what too much of our, our the thing that we're up against is that, as Leon mentioned, is the collapse of language. And part of that happens as, as a consequence of the shift in the 20th century from the idiom of print to the language of film. I mean, I won't go through a long exposition of McLuhan, but we, film it doesn't value uh, meaning. I mean, camera sees but doesn't think. And so they, it draws no distinction between a bloodbath in Afghanistan and a bubble bath in Paris. I mean, the, the, the idea is to elicit uh, a flood of consciousness or emotion, and it's not important as to what's the object of the uh, desire is. And as a result, we've lost a lot of vocabulary. Orwell makes the point in the politics of the English language. As our language deteriorates, we lose words. I mean, the vocabulary available to a graduating high school student in the United States in 1940 was something like 12,000 words, and today it's six. I'm not sure of those numbers, but, but they're like that. Because what we now do is we write for TV. And I've written for TV, and the, I can remember once having to do a six-part, six-hour documentary, The History of American Foreign Policy in the 20th century. And you would think six hours is a lot, but it's not a lot. And it came down to, at one point, I was given 78 words and 43 seconds, or 43 words and 78 seconds, I can't remember which, to uh, account for the origin of World War II. <laughs> and the, the, uh, <clears throat> at the same time, it had to be the voiceover transition from still photograph of a peace conference with Chamberlain in Munich in 1938 to news footage of uh, Nazi uh, planes bombing Warsaw in, in 1939. And it's at that point that I understood what McLuhan meant by the medium is the message. <laughs> Television is, it, film, it's, it's, a, it's a language that's, uh, it doesn't proceed it, it, in, in straight line. It, it goes around in circles. It's about ritual. It's about pattern recognition. It's about knowingness, not about knowledge. And it's a, one of the things that, that uh, is in the way of uh, what Arendt is talking about when she's talking about facts, because film is uh, 
well, docudrama. Um, it, it's, it, and it, it's, you can do all kinds of things with, with film that you, it, you can do things with print that you can't do with film and, and vice versa. But as we lose our language and, and write for um, the, the, the sound bite or the write for the short, it, again, uh, to write for, for, for TV is, is a whole different thing than, than, than writing for the page. I'm a believer in language, and, and I have to believe that that, that is the uh, hope of the future. And I, I believe two other things which I want to sort of end with because I'm going on too long. Um, the truth is, is what uh, is the courage of your, of your own mind. And it's not about uh, scandal in Washington. It, it's about the courage that you derived from not running a con game on your own thought. And that's the freedom, and, and that's the, the freedom of mind, which is, I think, liberty, as opposed to money. I mean, we, in this country, we tend to believe that Freedom is, is uh, freedom of markets as opposed to a freedom of mind, and I think that's making a mistake. And I want to end just because I like the quote so much with uh, something from T.H. White's novel, A Once and Future King, and this is uh, Merlin, who is the wizard talking to the young King Arthur. The best thing for being sad, replied Merlin, is to learn something. That's the only thing that never fails. You may grow old and trembling in your anatomies. You may lie awake at night listening to the disorder of your veins. You may miss your only love. You may see the world about you devastated by evil lunatics or know your honor trampled in the sewers of baser minds. There is only one thing for it then, to learn. Learn why the world wags and what wags it. That is the only thing which the mind can never exhaust, never alienate, never be tortured by, never fear or distrust, and never dream of regretting. Which is the hopeful note on which I will come mercifully to an end. <laughs>
that to be in accord with uh, that opinion is likely to lead to your advancement. I mean, think of it, I'll put it in the terms that I understand better, which are the terms of the, the journalist. I was at, at one point uh, when assigned by the Saturday Evening Post to spend, when Johnson was elected president in his own right in 1964, I, I was sent by the Saturday Evening Post to spend three months in Washington at the <laughs> Hay Adams Hotel across from the uh, uh, um, White House to write about uh, the ambiance of, of the Johnson White House. What was Johnson's equivalent to Kennedy's Camelot? And I went across, I made, gave my uh, credentials and I was admitted to the press corps on a temporary basis and then I talked to the press sec secretary who was a guy named Reedy and I said, Mr. Reedy, I am only here for three months and I'm not coming back. And so as far as I'm concerned, nothing is off the record. Nothing. If I hear it, if I see it, it, it goes. And the, um, he was perfectly happy with that because he knew that I'd never get close enough to see anything that was, that was <laughs> worth seeing more than anybody would ever tell me anything was worth seeing. But it enraged the, the uh, press corps because to stay around a White House uh, uh, long enough with the Washington press corps, uh, White House press corps, is to see what the, the, they're like. Uh, they're like the Japanese emperor's pet ducks. They, they, they kind of wander in and out, you know, they're directed around and, and the uh, press secretaries sort of throw breadcrumbs to them. Uh, and they, they looked particularly foolish over this period of three months because this was a period in which we invaded, among, you know, the Dominican Republic and Johnson gave four different reasons for doing that and he gave them, a, each time the press would, would swallow it. <clears throat> All of them were lies. But I could see that as, because I'm, I'm there for a longer length of time, so I, I'm writing the story as a narrative. And, and I could write that story, and they knew I was going to write that story. And the, uh, so they made it, and their fear was losing access. I mean, it, it, it's access to money or, or power or favor or something that, that, that is, uh, uh, m makes people careful about telling the truth. And we're also very polite people. We don't like to offend other, other people. I mean, the, um, um, but anyway, I mean, under the rule of the, the White House Press Corps put a rule through that I had to get a new credential every day. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't get the, the three months. Every, every day I had to come and talk to the same Secret Service guy and show him my passport. <laughs> But I mean, to be, to be in the entourage of power is, uh, people don't want to give that up. I mean, you know, if, if you start telling the truth as a journalist and it's a truth that, that uh, uh, the administration doesn't want to hear or that your contact in Congress doesn't want to hear, you're, you're, uh, you don't get the phone calls. And if you don't get the phone call, you don't, uh, become uh, a uh, successful journalist. You're out of the loop. People want to be in the loop, whatever that loop is. Well, I, I, I remember there was a Bill Moyers documentary in which he finally asked uh, all these journalists why 
they hadn't asked the hard questions about the weapons of mass destruction. And they all said that, essentially, we were afraid of being marginalized. We were afraid yeah. of being marginalized. But, but, but that same fear exists in situations that aren't even professional situations. I mean, a friend of mine told me a story that she had gone to some dinner in New York, and it was right after the uh, assassination of Osama bin Laden. And everyone was crowing with joy about this assassination. And she said, well, actually, she didn't think assassination was such a great idea. She believed in the rule of law. She thought the Nuremberg trials were, had been a good idea for an obvious reason. And she said that no one would speak to her at that dinner party afterward. They changed the subject to real estate or restaurants, what people talk about in New York. But, but it was as if she developed some communicable disease suddenly. So, um, so it's, I think it's, there's something, there's a kind of primal terror that goes beyond even professional terror of, of of saying, the, saying what's clearly true, or saying something that's not the popular opinion. Yeah, again, that's the tyranny, the tyranny of the majority. It's called go along to get along, right? <laughs> that's uh -huh. the, yeah. And, and the, um, no, people don't like to, that's why television, uh, satire tends to be entertainment more than it is uh, uh, violent. I mean, our gossip columns really are only, compare the ones to, to, to Britain, where it can get actually quite mean. Here, it's not mean. It, it's about loss of property or love affair or something, but it doesn't, I mean, nobody is going to say, uh, as Mencken would say, that a, a politician is by definition a man who crawls and knows the taste of boot polish. I mean, it, I mean that is true of Obama, but it, 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 it would not be, it would not sit well. I mean, it, it, it's, it's obviously also true of, uh, uh, Mitt Romney, but it's a nonpartisan observation. Oh, yeah. But but the the uh, <laughs> but it, it, it's it's not the kind of thing that uh, would sit well you know, in polite company, and you know, <clears throat> one of the reasons that satire has 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 gone out of vogue or be, been turned into. Uh, entertainment of a very soft kind is it's since it's since World War two you can read the satire of the Americans before the uh, before World War two I mean we don't take ourselves that seriously and so you produce people like Mencken and um, Alfred J Knock and even Chaplin but once we become the greatest power in the world after 1945, the American supremacy, economic colossus, the newborn son of the British Empire and so on, together with the possession of the uh, atomic bomb, gives us a uh, a sense of self-importance and, and the, the satirical edge uh, begins to uh, go away from, uh, you know, drift out of, of American writing. I mean, there's still a few uh, leftovers like Lenny Bruce, <clears throat> but by and, by and large, it's, it, it's, it's a change and it's a change that comes with the Republican Risorgimento of, of the 1980s and the dawn of the new America and Reagan um, um, prosperity and, and the conservative drift of the country over the last uh, 30 odd years. It's, uh, I just read Last week, an interesting new book by a man named Stephen Ross called Hollywood 
left and right, and it's, he's talking about politics as they have been played in, around, by Hollywood since the beginning, since, 19, since 1912. There are a lot of political movies in, in, during World War I um, against the war, and that they're shut down by the Hoover in the FBI and the Red Scare of 1919. But he talks about the difference between the uh, Hollywood politics on the right, which are Louis B. Mayer, Charlton Heston, um, Schwarzenegger, Reagan, and so on, and the, and the left, which would be Jane Fonda and Warren Beatty and Chaplin and Edward G. Robinson. But the, he, he says that the left tends to uh, think, talk about hope and guilt, what America might become, the things that we are doing wrong and how we could make them better uh, along the lines of, let's say, FTR's New Deal. <clears throat> and people don't want, there's not a big audience for that. The, 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 the right, the audience on the right, their two uh, str uh, talking points are reassurance and fear. We're under attack by monstrous Soviet Union, or by the, the Viet Cong, or by the uh, hostile aliens, or terrorists, or, or uh, drugs, or crime, or, or some. We're surround innocent, pure, Norman Rockwell, Courier and Ives, Louis B. Mayer, America is under threat. And therefore, here we have reassurance of uh, the weapons industry <laughs> you know, and, and the, uh, uh, a return to, to the entirely imaginary values that were once imagined, you know, thought to be uh, free and loose on, on the American frontier. I mean, the, our whole idea of the American West is essentially an invention of Hollywood. But the uh, Again, it, 